Right. Well, thanks, Wendy. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the March Conditions and Outlooks Briefing. Yes, it's March already. Uh, I'm Tony Bergantino, Director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the, uh, the Water Resources Data System. And this webinar is uh, again being presented by my office in coordination with the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub, University of Wyoming Extension, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, the State Engineer's Office, Bureau of Reclamation, uh, and the National Weather Service and National Weather Service River Forecast Center. And today we will uh, be looking at the current drought and climate conditions, surface water conditions, uh, reservoir storage, and then look forward with some uh, weather forecasts and outlook. And then I'll give a brief overview of the Cocoa Raws program. So let's uh, start it off as always with the current U.S. Drought Monitor map. Uh, again, this came out this morning, shows where we're at as of Tuesday, the uh, 21st, I believe it was, yeah. Uh, we're continuing to see some improvements along the edges of the, the present drought extent, as well as uh, an interior area here in the, in the Green River Basin that went from uh, uh, severe down to, to moderate drought this week. Uh, looking at the timelines, here's the updated timeline showing percentage of Wyoming in each drought category from uh, the year 2000 to present. And while it has declined, there is still some of that D3 or extreme drought in, in Wyoming. And that D3 has been somewhere on the map now for the last 140 weeks. Uh, it has remained rather stationary the last few weeks, though, with not, not changing in, in size or extent. Just over 38% uh, of the state is in the D1 to D4 level, which is actual drought. That D0 is uh, not an actual drought category, but considered normally, abnormally dry and is a, a heads up condition. Uh, that 38% we're at now is a decrease of about 6% uh, since the last webinar. So we, we continue to see improvement overall, but since this is statewide, as they say, your conditions may vary. So. You can find similar graphs at the county level at the link on, uh, on the bottom of this slide. And those are updated weekly uh, right after the, the drought monitor map is released. So sometime around mid morning, the, the updated maps or timelines are out there. And zooming in showing from the start of 2020 to present. So you can see what the, the last drought period looks like in a bit more uh, detail. Uh, still that 1.29% of the state in uh, extreme drought, uh, which is, I say, unchanged, uh, even since the last webinar. Over half the state now has no D category whatsoever, though, and that's the largest area since we started going into this current drought. So that's a, that's a positive sign on the, on the statewide look. 14-day uh, total precipitation uh, statewide is a percentile. Uh, so this is the average uh, or the total precipitation over the last two weeks, fairly dry in those two weeks in uh, central and eastern Wyoming, but with some continued snows in uh, some of the western western areas. Uh, jumping back to 90 days or about the three month time frame, things are a lot wetter at the 90 day, but still dry in the in the northwest, uh, especially the winds, Tetons and, and the areas around. Uh, there's still that little spot in the southern Bighorns and then northeastern Park County and then some in uh, along the Albany Laramie County border area that are missing out a little bit on the on the precip over the last three months. Jumping up the uh, standardized precipitation index or the SPI um, and these show the index indexes for the 30 and 60 day time frames on the top and then one year down on the bottom right here. And uh, remember that these maps show an index value and not actual precipitation amounts. Uh, I've stopped highlighting the wet areas since they're so widespread, as you can see, we have a lot of that blue or wet showing up on the 30 and 60 day map still. But you can see some uh, emerging areas of concern down in the, in the southeast and central parts on the 30 day time frame. And at one year, there's uh, you know, still a lot of area in the blue or on the wet side, uh, though at less uh, intense levels. And then you can also see the longer term dryness showing up in the, in the east and southeast, as well as areas like the Tetons and the northwestern side of the winds, although I fairly obliterated that on the map with, uh, with my outline here. Uh, 14 day, again, we're looking at two weeks, uh, average minimum temperature, average minimums up here on the upper right over the last two weeks, still below freezing. Uh, with the lowest temperatures being in the upper green and the Yellowstone Plateau, along with a few other high elevation areas. Uh, the highest lows, say that twice, have been in the southeast, 
Um, on the lower left showing departure from average, you can see the entire state except for some small border areas here on the on the uh, Goshen Platte counties have been below average with the west as well as the northern parts of the northeast having the, the greatest departure below average. Uh, looking at maximum temperature uh, again over the last two weeks uh, on the upper right, most of the low elevation areas are are seeing highs above the 32 and when, when averaged out over the last 14 days. Uh, south and east again has been the warmest while the the upper green and then the higher elevations of the mountainous areas have been coolest. Uh, in terms of a departure from average, yep, below again, uh, the entire state more than three degrees below average with most of it being more than uh, nine degrees below. The warmest areas are, we're down in the, you know, at least compared to average, we're down in the southeast here and the northwest, but you have some, some real cold spots uh, as far as in terms of uh, the average here in the in Fremont County, and then again here in the uh, the Upper Green Basin, where we were seeing departures as much as 15 degrees below normal. Uh, soil moisture, some improvements in the far west, but uh, worsening conditions in the far north uh, east over here, uh, south central regions, east, uh, and then there's that area in uh, northern Park County, uh, which sort of spills over into uh, Bighorn County and parts of Sheridan County as well, where we're starting to see the moisture levels in the soil start to start to go down only the 30th to 40th percentile, but uh, go in the wrong direction. Uh, snow, mixed bag and snow over the last two weeks. We've uh, lost ground in the northeast and the Bighorn Basin, but have had some improvements in snow cover in the southwest and then in some of the central areas where we're seeing basically bare ground, which is, is now covered. Um, looking at the snowpack uh, by basins compared to median, uh, South Platte in Wyoming continues to be our, our underperformer, but it's at least even with last year's uh, showing. Uh, the Shoshone is in second, but still right at 100% of median, and the ra remainder range from uh, about 106 in the Yellowstone and Bighorn Basins all the way up to 161% uh, down in the Little Snake. Uh, the map here on the on the right is showing where we were uh, on this day last year. Uh, so we're we're tied for where we were last year in the in the South Platte at 83% of median, but the entire rest of the state is doing uh, much much better than we were at this time last year. Look at snowpack by basin again, uh, but in a more of a numeric form. This shows the status of all the basins as a percentage of the median peak snow water equivalent. Uh, so I have the data sorted by that percentage in the sixth column. And while the map on the last slide, um, that showed the basins as a percent of today's median snow water equivalent, uh, this column, this uh, sixth column here is showing the percentage of the seasonal median peak. That is uh, the most that you get in the entire season, not just today. Uh, and we range from the South Platte at 75% to the Little Snake at 142%. Uh, another way of looking at this, the way it's sorted, is if we don't receive any more snow this season, uh, nine basins will have exceeded the normal median snowpack for this year, which is pretty good considering that uh, uh, last year none reached the median peak. Um, column three gives the, uh, the current snow water equivalent in inches, while five shows uh, how much above or below the median uh, seasonal peak value that is. And if you want to look at this in some more detail, it's it's updated daily at the uh, the URL down here on the on the lower left. So we'll look at those uh, those two basins, those two extremes, in a bit more detail. Uh, I skipped the South Platte since it's based, I believe, on two stations, but we'll look at the Tongue and the Little Snake here. Uh, and these charts show the the buildup of the Tongue here uh, on the on the left, and. While at 83% of median, the tongue is currently above the median for the state. And on the uh, right here in the Little Snake, well, uh, we busted into uncharted territory uh, last week and are, we're now at historical highs, uh, historical meaning since uh, 1986, but still a, a fair long period. And right now, if no more snow falls in the Little Snake, the uh, water year 2023 will still have been at the third highest of the last 38 years. And now you know what they say about too much of a good thing, and that is a concern because all the snow still has to come off too. And uh, Sweetwater County officials already are, are preparing for flooding, but 
more on that later in the webinar and uh, moving up to surface water conditions, I will turn it over to Brian Loving with the USGS. Thank you, Tony. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, we, in the winter time, there are several sites where we cannot compute flows because if there's a significant amount, of, significant amount of ice in the channel, we're not able to, we don't have a good uh, relation between the river height and the flow. So you notice there are a lot of gray dots still on the map this time of year, gray being sites where we cannot compute flow because of ice right now. So um, I guess moving on to the next slide, we'll kind of talk about what the general conditions are. We're starting to come out of ice at a few sites. We're starting to see a little, a few more of the dots with some color on the map. Um, and there's a pretty wide range. We have sites out there right now that are um, much below normal or kind of down in the 10th percentile or less than 10th percentile flow. But then we have other sites that are higher than the, um, up in the 90th percentile. So a lot of that's just a reflection of the time of year. The flows are generally low and it doesn't take much flow. It doesn't take much of a change in flow before we're um, outside of the normal range this time of year. So uh, as we move into next month and the month, definitely by May, we'll start to get a better idea of what's going on with the stream flows um, around the state. Uh, because we don't, because so many sites are in ice right now, and it's, it's hard to get an idea of what the what the conditions are. I've just pulled up a couple of examples of specific streams. Um, so the first one up in the Bighorn Basin, Bighorn River at Basin, um, you can see that through most of the winter so far this year, we've been kind of at normal flows or maybe at the higher end of normal flows. Uh, we had a little bit of um, low elevation snow melt right there. Uh, it, it, we got some runoff from that, and we're still a little above normal from that runoff that we had. Um, moving down to the south end of the state, Laramie River at Laramie. Uh, again, kind of similar conditions. Most It's fluctuated a little bit more there, but generally it's kind of been in the average or average or that kind of middle normal percentile of flow. Had a little bit of um, low elevation snow melt a week ago or excuse me, we go during the last two or three weeks uh, that caused us to get up to, to what were at one for one day, the highest flows that we'd had at that time, you know, for early March this year. So um, definitely it's, it's early to tell what's going to happen but with this, the snowpack that Tony just talked about and base stream flow conditions through the winter. I think they're going to be, we're going to, it looks like for most of the state, we're in, we're in much better shape for stream flow right now than we were a year ago. All right, and then moving on to my last slide, talking about the reservoir conditions around the state. Um, it varies as it normally does from month to month. Some of the reservoirs up, some of the reservoirs down, but I would say most of the reservoirs had slight increases as we had some of this low elevation snow melt and runoff um, around the state. And with that, that's it for uh, USGS Streamflow. Thanks, Brian. And to talk more about reservoirs and operations, we have uh, Liz Cresto with the Bureau of Reclamation. Liz? Hi. Yep, I'm Liz Cresto with the Bureau of Reclamation. I'm out of the Wyoming Area Office. We cover two areas within the state for reclamation facilities. The North Platte shown in that kind of peach color, and then the Bighorn Basin to the north um, shown in blue. Starting off with the Bighorn system, to, as of the 21st of March, the um, system is 72% full and we're in pretty good shape with Bull Lake being 98% of average, Buffalo Bill at 101% of average and Boysen at 105% of average. Next slide. So um, starting in January, Reclamation does monthly forecasts for the runoff season of April through July. And shown there on the left is our forecast for Buffalo Bill and Boysen for April through July. Um, Buffalo Bill runoff is anticipated to be 700,000 acre feet, which is 94% of average. And Boysen um, inflow forecast for April through July is 800,000 acre feet or 131% of average. Then on our left is a little schematic of our current reservoir um, and releases. And we are transitioning from kind of going from pretty much static winter releases into the spring 
runoff season as, as well as the irrigation season. So expect releases to be changing in the next several weeks. And at the bottom of the slide shows a website where you can get information on water orders or where we post when we're gonna change flows. So starting off with Buffalo Bill, we're currently seeing around 700 CFS at the Cody River gauge. We're going to continue that release until um, April 11th. And on the April 11th, we'll do a flushing flow as and Wyoming Game and Fish requested this flushing flow to mobilize sediment downstream. And that flush will occur between April 11th and 14th. Flows will initially raise up to 4,500 CFS and then back down to 3,500 CFS for the remainder of the flush. And then at the conclusion of the flush, we'll probably be releasing around 1,200 CFS. But that, all those will come out in terms of news releases and water orders as well. Boysen is currently releasing 900 CFS and we actually have a flushing flow scheduled for March 28th, which is next Tuesday. There is a caveat that um, we are watching downstream ice conditions. And if we need to, we may have to adjust that date um, to let that ice clear. And Bull Lake is releasing 25 CFS. And I, at this point, we don't have anticipation of um, changing those flows. The so next slide, it's moving on to the North Platte system. North Platte um, was a little drier than um, the Bighorn side of things last year. And so the reservoir system's uh, lower than um, to the north of us there. So the reservoir system is 44% full or 74% of average. And you can see in that table, the current contents, the capacity, the percent full and the percent of average. In terms of runoff forecasts, with the snowpack looking pretty healthy, um, the runoff for Seminole is 870,000 acre feet or 121% of average. Sweetwater above Pathfinder, 80,000 acre feet, which equates to 150% of average. And Alcova to Glendo, 150,000 acre feet or 103% of average. Given the low reservoir contents, um, we're anticipating being able to store much of that runoff. Next um, slide. This is a um, schematic of our current releases. 530 CFS um, is in the Miracle Mile stretch. And we're in the middle of a flushing flow below Gray Reef. And that this is actually a 10 day or March 20th through 29th flush. And how they work their flush is that they change the flows daily, fluctuates between 450 and 4,000 CFS. So that will run through March 29th. After the flush concludes, we'll return the flow below Gray Reef to 450 CFS. Current releases at Glendo are 25 CFS and Guernsey, zero CFS. And the same applies for the North Platte look at those water orders for changes because runoff season is coming and so is irrigation season. So that's all I have. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Thanks. Now look at uh, forecasts and outlooks. We have Jerry Swanson with the National Weather Service in Riverton. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so you can see here's the seven day uh, precipitation outlook. Uh, we had some snow um, overnight, an uh, inch or two. A uh, few places had four to five inches. Um, and uh, we should see a break for now, except the West. They're going to see um, very few breaks in the snow and snow showers through the week. Um, starting Friday afternoon, there's a good storm coming in. Um, and it looks like northern parts of Wyoming are going to see the um, higher amounts. And you can see all the the darker green and the blues up in the mountains uh, for the northern parts um, with that system um, Friday afternoon through through Saturday night into early Sunday morning. Um, the south not looking to see too much out of those storms. Uh, Sunday, Monday or Monday, Tuesday looking uh, like a, a good break even for the west and then the next storm moving in again um, next Wednesday. 
uh, that's going to bring in more snow. All right, so you can see here, unfortunately, uh, we are looking for strong signal for the below normal temperatures um, across Wyoming, especially the western areas um, for the next, uh, for the six to 10 day outlook. So that is going to keep that ice in place a little longer. So we'll, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that. Precipitation outlook, um, just slightly favored for above normal precipitation for the six to 10 day outlook uh, through April 1st. Go ahead. The, on the 8 to 14 day, I'm still looking um, at below normal temperatures, not quite as, um, as strong um, an outlook, uh, but still favored to be likely colder than, uh, than normal. Um, but the precipitation looks like it may be uh, going to a near normal precipitation, except for that little bit across the north. Um, but mainly for the whole state, we are looking at uh, near normal precipitation for the 18 to 8 to 14 day outlook through the 5th of April. All right, so then we could, we've got just for um, temperatures, um, just a slight risk of uh, below normal temperatures across what you can see across the entire uh, western half of the United States. But it's nice to see just a slight risk. Um, at this time. So it's going to be below normal, but not those extreme cold temperatures that we were seeing um, in the past weeks. And as far as risks of heavy snow, just that one little stretch across southern Wyoming, um, a risk of a slight risk of some heavy snow um, just for that area. And we should be pretty good on, on a heavy snowfall across the state. Go ahead. Um, and then here's our three uh, three month outlook, April uh, through June. You can see um, just the southwestern corner. They're still looking for those below uh, below normal temperatures with equal chances across the state uh, for temperatures for the, th the three month outlook. Uh, and then precipitation wise, looking at equal chances for uh, the entire state. So that can be good or bad, depending on how we're looking at it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get enough precipitation to keep us um, out of the heavier droughts. Okay, yeah, right. I, think, well, I think that's it. Uh, that's it, thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And now we have Kevin Lowe, Lowe at the River Forecast Center to talk to us about flood potential. All righty, thank you, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, we actually have something to talk about uh, <laughs> this year. Um, so, I'm Kevin Lau. I'm with the National Weather Service Missouri Basin River Forecast Center in Kansas City, and I'll be talking uh, about not only the Missouri drainage, but also the Columbia and the uh, Colorado as well. So uh, the map you see here, um, it depicts the uh, next 90 days as far as uh, flood potential. Green means that we don't expect flooding over the next 90 days. Uh, the orange colors and I've circled those that's along the North Platte, we do expect minor flooding to occur uh, over the next 90 days. In fact, we can probably pinpoint it um, the first uh, week or so in June is, is typically when we see the, um, the crest uh, uh, moving through the North Platte there. So um, again, uh, as Tony mentioned, uh, we're blessed to have good snows, but with that uh, comes now the potential for some flooding. So we do expect minor flooding along the North Platte River, and those are the only two locations within the state uh, that we're actually out looking uh, for minor flooding. Now, uh, in talking with some folks, um, uh, the uh, local weather forecast offices, as well as my uh, uh, colleagues at the Northwestern River Forecast Center and also the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center. There are some rivers that uh, we are uh, keeping a close eye on. Uh, the, the Poposia, the Little Wind, and the Lower Laramie, and that's within the, uh, the Missouri Basin uh, drainage, of course. Uh, the Snake River, um, they are keeping a close eye on it. And, uh, and then in the uh, Colorado Basin, the Little Snake and the Bear. Uh, again, none of those rivers our outlook to have minor flooding yet, but we still have a, a good month to go uh, for snow accumulation. So it wouldn't take that much to tip the odds uh, to have uh, flooding concerns along those. The, um, uh, so this map, you can get to this map from that link that is at the lower left 
uh, of this graph. And also uh, the National Weather Service issued its US Spring Outlook, which includes the flood outlook uh, for the entire United States. It released that on March 16th, just last week, I guess. And you can find that on the link to the right, bottom right. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Well, this month I'd like to talk some about Cocoa Raws. Um, this program has been mentioned uh, in many of the webinars as a source of precipitation information, but we've never really given a history or detailed explanation of what the program is. So that's what I'd like to do in the, in the time remaining today. Uh, the program collects uh, precipitation in all of its forms, thus giving the name Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. So what is Cocoa Raws? Well, it's uh, volunteer observers make up the network. Uh, people like you and me and your neighbor uh, consists of people interested in weather who set up a rain gauge, which uh, uh, we'll provide. Uh, people then create an account at the Cocoa Raws site and then report their precipitation or lack of it each day. Uh, volunteers are collecting data in all 50 states now, plus Puerto Rico, Guam, Canada, the Bahamas, and there may be one or two places else by now. Uh, it's turned into the largest provider of uh, daily precipitation observations in the, in the country. It started in Fort Collins when the, the rain also started in Fort Collins on the 27th of July of 97. And by the next day, a maximum of 14 and a half inches had fallen on the city, causing some, some severe flooding. Uh, there were five fatalities, dozens of injuries, and uh, millions and millions of dollars in damage. And that flood emphasized how variable precipitation can be. Uh, over a distance of about five miles, there was a range of two to 14 and a half inches of precipitation that fell. And creating this map was a long process that involved putting out calls by the Colorado Climate Center to the people of Fort Collins for anyone who had precipitation gauges out or buckets or wheelbarrows or a coffee cup sitting on a deck even. Mm -hmm. and, they made multiple visits to people to uh, assess conditions and collecting devices and get a good idea of how much fell at different parts in the city. And the need for more rain gauges and a better handle on precipitation vari variation became very, very obvious. Uh, a grant from FEMA was given and a proto Raz was started in Fort Collins in 1998. And over the next few years, it spread out to other parts of Colorado. And then Nolan Duskin, who is the former Colorado State Climatologist, uh, and I had a conversation about expanding the network out of Colorado, and a plan was set up to target the, the Four Corners area of um, Wyoming, Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado, uh, with an emphasis on also collecting hail information, since that area is, is so prone to it. Uh, I began creating maps, and the earliest version of an interactive map to serve the data and prepared for part of a, a four-state four region, uh, it didn't take too long to tell myself that uh, if we're going to do this in one little part of area of Wyoming, we're going to do it for the entire state. Um, now, Nebraska at the time had their own network called Any Rain, and so held off formally becoming part of Kokoraz. So in 2003, Wyoming became the second state in the network, and a year later, Kansas came in. Nebraska ultimately did join the network in uh, 2013, but it, it took a few more years for them to, to decide to do so. But right after Kansas, New Mexico decided they would like to become involved, and I expanded the, the mapping capabilities to include that state. And I had barely finished adding the capability to handle New Mexico when Texas wanted in. Uh, so I, again, began expanding the, the geographic range. And at this point, I realized that this was going to go nationwide eventually, so set up the base map for the entire, for the entire country. Fortunately, along the way, Julian Turner was hired by the Colorado Climate Center to be devoted entirely to the interface and the, and the database. So that uh, got me out of having to have another hat. But the static maps that are still used at uh, state, county, and occasional city level are still the ones that I created back in the early uh, 2000s. So why Coco Ross? Well, I've already gone over uh, much of this, but here's two inf images that emphasize that Location really matters for precipitation. Uh, the image on the left, uh, this was taken by the Coco Ross National Coordinator, Henry Regis, shows just how localized events can be. Um, well, the image here on the left is a, is a prism grid, which shows the variability more on a, on a national scale. 
as the network grew and the, the data became available, numerous entities started using the data. And I'm not even going to begin to try to list them all or go into how they use the data. But you can see several of them here on this slide. Um, it covers the operational usage, planning, research, as well as uh, you know, numerous sectors from agriculture to water supply forecasting. So how can you help and what are some of the benefits of helping? Um, you can start by clicking the Join Coco Raws link on the homepage, which takes you to a form to, to put in your information and station location. Uh, for Wyoming observers, I'll provide you with the standard four-inch rain gauge. Um, and once you receive it, it needs to be set up in uh, you know, a relatively open area. For urban locations, this may be, may be a bit more difficult. But the, the key is to get it as far as reasonably possible from uh, trees, walls, other obstructions. And when you're set up, simply read your gauge at a consistent time each day preferably uh, early morning, uh, but it's better to pick a time that you will most often be able to read it at the same time. Uh, so when you set, sign up, you're set up with the account and log in, which you use to input your data. The basic requirement is to put the precipitation, including a zero when you receive none, but you can also choose to add uh, additional data if you can, such as uh, comments regarding an event, uh, when it started and so on. Uh, during the winter, you enter the water equivalent of the snow, not the depth of the snow, meaning that uh, how much liquid is in the water when it's in the snow when it's melted is what you would enter. And you can also, but it's not required, uh, put it in the depth of what fell, the depth of what's on the ground and things like that. And, and those zeros are so important because we also need to know when rain didn't fall. And you can also, uh, through your account, submit a condition report. Uh, it's a, another form, but you can put in what sort of conditions you're experiencing, both on the wet and the dry side. And these reports show up on a, on a different map and they're used when uh, creating recommendations for the US Drought Monitor. Uh, both the national and, and the state folks look at these when they're submitted to, to make recommendations for, for that drought map. So what are the benefits? Well, there's many ways we benefit from the data you enter, but how do you benefit? Uh, what, what does the observer get out of it? Um, there's obviously the, the good feeling of providing a valuable source of information, but it goes, goes beyond that. Uh, first, once you enter a report, you can see it on a local or uh, statewide, or if you squint hard enough, a national map. Uh, these three on the, on the left are the original maps that I mentioned earlier, while the rightmost map is a, a new dynamic mapping interface that you can use to, to zoom in on some of the spots, or all the spots actually. And you can see what you've received compared to what your neighbors might have gotten. Uh, you can view the data numerically, such as in this table. Uh, your data can be tabulated and charted. Uh, once you're a reporting station, you'll be able to quickly access monthly or annual totals from your station. Uh, you can graph the data compared to what the 30-year the normals are at, at your location. And then through time, your data will help to improve the resolution of those normals. Uh, you'll be able to readily access your precipitation data for your station for any time period you wish. So the, the Coco Ross system will also sort of serve as a, an archive for the readings that, uh, that you've entered as well. So I'd, I'd encourage people to join. We'll provide a, a gauge like this one, uh, minus the rainbow and the accompanying uh, gold. And you can provide the, the precipitation reports. So if anyone you know or yourself is interested, I, I, as I say, I'd encourage you to join and, and help make these maps even better. And with that, I'd like to, to thank my fellow presenters who you can see on this slide along with our, our contact information. And I'll turn it over to Wendy Kelly to bring us into Q&A.